Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well today, and I hope that you are surviving this social distancing thing all right. I want to welcome you into the online presence and community of the Grace Reformed Church for our second ever live stream uh, broadcast of this kind of mini worship service and message by me. And I am Pastor Dave Van Netten. I have the privilege of pastoring the Grace Reformed Church. What a privilege, what an honor that is. And we just want to welcome you all in today. Uh, we welcome those who may be visiting or are first time friends of Grace Church and uh, to anybody who may be viewing this live on Facebook right now or uh, to those who will be seeing it a little bit later on YouTube. And uh, I was checking the stats this morning about last week's first ever live stream video. And it turns out that we had 269 views and uh, on Facebook and 17 views on YouTube. So we're off to a great start. That's more than our Sunday worship attendance average. So it's great to have you with us today. And I'm so glad that you are here. I'm coming to you live from the comfortable confines of my home office um, and uh, where I am kind of casual today. And uh, you may be casual as well, and that's just great. And I am so glad that you have decided to join us this morning for this kind of mini worship service today as we meet online. And it's my hope and my encouragement to you that maybe you could just kind of pause from whatever you're doing for a moment, uh, that you could just kind of be still and enjoy our time together this morning, that it might uh, provide some encouragement and uh some uh, hope for you as well. And I'd like to begin today with a uh, call to worship, which happens to be our lectionary passage this morning. It comes to us from Psalm 130. Hear these words of our Lord. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, and therefore you are to be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O people of God, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Praise God. Would you join me in prayer as we begin this morning? Our Father in heaven, we come to you today and we thank you for the, uh, for the gift of technology that allows us to be together this morning, even as we are prohibited from gathering in person physically. Lord, we prefer to be together at the church. We love to share hugs and handshakes and and warm embraces with one another. And yet today, Lord, in this new world that we live in, uh, we are here today separately in our own homes or wherever we may be. But God, we know that wherever we are, your spirit is with us, that you are present, that there is no place that we can be where you are not. And Lord, your hand of grace and mercy, your care and your comfort, they reach down to us wherever we may be today. May we feel your peace and your presence. And Lord, we just give you thanks for this time together today. And we invite you in. And Lord, we just pray that your spirit will come and move and work in us and through us today. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So today as we begin, I'd like to try something a little different. I'm getting used to the technology. Uh, as maybe some of you are as well. I'm not used to being on Facebook, been on Facebook now for about a week and a half or a few days. And uh, so, but I'd like to just invite you to participate in kind of an interactive sharing of praises and thanksgivings at this time. So if you have a keyboard or your phone, um, I'd like to just invite you. I can see those comments as you're coming in and who's joined and so forth. And if you would like to just share, I'll kind of scroll down. And uh, if I can understand the technology correctly, um, I will read uh, any praises and thanksgivings that you would like to most keep in mind. They're going out to the world. So, um, but maybe just a word or two of some thanksgivings that you have. Is there anyone who would like to share a word of thanksgivings? And uh, good morning to all of you too. It's good to see you and good to see so many of you have joined 
uh, our group this morning. So are there some thanksgivings that you would like to share? Uh, we welcome all of you in. Good to see you there. Anybody? Have any comments uh, on this video that you would like to make? And you can just put your Thanksgivings right into, into that online. So it's good to, good to have you all with us. Anybody? Sure if I'm seeing uh, correctly. I'm seeing who joined. I'm not sure if I, yeah, some of the comments are coming through too. And uh, so we welcome you in. It's good to be together today, even this way. I don't see any comments coming in, so I'm not sure if I'm not understanding the technology or or maybe you're just a little bit shy this morning. Ah, there we go. Thank you, Melissa, for family support. Praise God for that, especially in this time of uh, what is kind of isolation for some of us. Pam Anderson says, thanks that we can gather. Thank you, Pam. Cassie, Joe, thank you, Robin. Cassie says, I'm thankful to be well and still able to help others. Praise God for that as well. As some of you are submitting your uh, comments, your praises and thanksgiving, I, I think of Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. You might remember that Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. And yet in prison, in this dungeon of a prison, probably with rats running around their feet, they were shackled and in chains, and yet they were praising our great God. Today we might find the situation a little less than desirable. You may feel like you're in your own prison, maybe stuck in your house, uh, but there's always reasons to give thanks. And so today, let's continue to do that. Thank you, Elroy. He says, thank you for our Grace Church family. Miss being together. My brother Mark is here. He says, we're all healthy. The kids are all working yet. That's great news. Judy Berger says, thank you um, to, um, to still be able to be working. Abby is uh, with us, and welcome, Abby. So glad to finally get to worship with you all again. And uh, Nadia Boyke says, we miss all of you guys. Thanks for uh, such a dedicated pastor and church members. Uh, my brother Larry joined, and Kevin says, I'm thankful uh, for a dedicated, loving, faithful pastor in church, and I'm just thankful for all of you guys as well. And uh, so any other thanksgivings or praises this morning as we come together? I know that there are many. and um, and so this is an opportunity to share those with one another as we gather here online. And uh, so with that, I would like to just um, uh, offer a, a little song of praise, and I invite you to sing with me. Some of you know the doxology it's called, uh, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. And right there where you are, I would invite you to sing with me. And you say, well, I'm not a singer. That's okay, because nobody can hear you. <laughs> so, so would you... Would you join me in these words of the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you so much for participating in that time of, of sharing. I'm going to hide your comments now so I can focus on what's ahead of us today. You know, as we gather in the presence of our almighty God, and we are remembering that our Lord is, is holy and pure and good in every way, as we look into the mirror of our own lives, into our own hearts, we see kind of a different story, don't we? Uh, we try and we strive to be the people that God wants us to be, and yet too often we fall short. And uh, thankfully, there is forgiveness and there is a Savior. And so I'd like to read a kind of a call to worship this morning. It's from Mark chapter 8, and it's verse 34, just one verse. In fact, I can just recite it. You might know it real well. It's a very appropriate passage for Lent. It is uh, Jesus, and he says to the crowds, he said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Those three things, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. We especially think of this during our season of Lent. Uh, let us go to the Lord as we confess our sins together in prayer. Let's pray. Father, again, we, we come before you and we admit, Lord, readily that we are not the people that you call us to be. 
we have not always loved you with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength, nor have we loved our neighbors and others as much as we love ourselves. And yet, Lord, your grace and your forgiveness reaches to even us. And we thank you, Father, that there is a Savior, that there is one who took up his cross, even as we might shun from taking up ours. And Lord, we thank you that through Jesus, all of our shortcomings, all of our sins are forgiven. And so, Lord, thank you for the forgiveness that is found in him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then hear these words of assurance also from Mark chapter 8, the very next verse, verse 35. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, says Jesus. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Friends, I invite you to take your Bibles and to turn there to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look today at a passage that in my Bible is entitled The Temptation of Jesus. And I'm just going to make sure that our task cam is working here a moment, so bear with me. For whatever reason, it doesn't seem to be working, so we'll just press on. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And I want to invite you to turn there, and maybe you have a pen or pencil with you in the sermon outline that I sent to you via email. And hopefully you've been able to print that off, and uh, you can follow along. And if you'd like to, jot some notes down as we go today. And so as you're turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to read that scripture in sections as we go today uh, throughout the body of this message. But as you're turning there, I want to ask you this question. Do you like taking tests? <laughs> I don't think I know of anybody that really enjoys taking tests. I still remember in eighth grade algebra class when our teacher, Miss Vancouvering, would uh, issue a pop quiz or a pop test and say, okay, everybody take everything off your desk except a pen and a pencil. And uh, she would hand out a kind of a half sheet of five algebra questions, polynomials, binomials, all of that. I didn't even understand that, didn't even know what questions to ask. And there was on more than one occasion, I did not do very well in those pop quizzes or pop tests. Some of you know that one of my favorite stories about testing comes to us from Pastor John Ortberg, who shares a story about a college student, a young man who was taking his final exams. And he was taking his uh, final exam in ornithology, the study of birds. And he unfortunately had been kind of sloughing off a little bit during the school year and he really really needed to pass this test and he was very serious about it he studied very hard and he he, he thought he had mastered the material uh, but he went into the class on the day of the test and the teacher it was a big lecture hall of a couple hundred students in a big university but the teacher had kind of surprised all of the students rather than a kind of typical examination to the professor had put and posted all around the walls of the lecture hall the pictures of birds, but only the birds' feet. And the test was for all of the students to identify what the birds were by the picture of merely their feet. And the young man who really needed to pass this test and to score well, he just flipped out and he thought, this is crazy. I, I can't take this test. I can't, I can't do this. I'm never going to pass. And he went down to the instructor at his, at his desk and podium there in the lecture hall. And he said, this is ridiculous. This is a test. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take this test. And, and the instructor said to him, well, if you don't take the test, you're, you're going to fail the course. And he said, that's ridiculous. He says, I need to pass this course, he said. And, but this test is just insane. And uh, so he said, the instructor said to him again, well, if you don't want to, take this test he said then you're you're going to you're going to fail the test you're going to fail the course and uh, so the instructor said tell me your name and uh, the young man said well uh why should i tell you my name he said well tell me your name you passed you failed excuse me you failed the test and uh so the young man took off his shoes and his socks and he rolled up his uh pants and he says you tell me <laughs> i love I love that story. How many of you know that we 
are all undergoing a test like no other right now. This is something unprecedented in our lifetime, this coronavirus pandemic. Uh, people in America all around the world are being tested like never before. Uh, some are watching loved ones struggle, even die from this, uh, this deadly virus. Government, healthcare systems, they're all being tested today. Businesses, companies, and churches are being tested like, not, uh, like never before. Uh, some people are being laid off from work and their families are being tested financially. Parents who are home with children and homeschooling, you, you are being tested as well. And, and children and youth, you're feeling some stress these days as well, I'm sure. Everyone is going through a test like never before. I saw an item of humor on Facebook this past week, and now that I'm finally on Facebook, I can, I can see what you're posting, so you better be careful. <laughs> but I saw an item of humor on Facebook this past week. Uh, it was a picture of a, a man with a caption who said, I wasn't planning on giving this much up for Lent. It is interesting that this virus pandemic comes to us during one of the church's most sacred seasons, that of Lent. For Lent is a time, of course, of testing. It is a time to give things up. It is a time to go without for a while. Maybe you've given some things up for Lent. It is a time to sacrifice and, yes, even to suffer as Jesus did. And it may surprise you, but Jesus also went through a season of testing and trial. You might say that Jesus went through his own personal season of Lent. In fact, our season of Lent, the 40 weekdays between Ash Wednesday and Easter, was established as a reflection of the 40 days of testing that Jesus endured in the wilderness. And that's why Lent is a time to identify with the sufferings and struggles of Jesus. It is a time to, to go without. Now, we were probably thinking of giving up chocolate or sweets or pizza during this time of Lent, uh, but now we're being asked to actually give up some human contact and, and gatherings in public and maybe going out to eat and maybe some even losing a job or being laid off during this time. So the question becomes, how can we pass the test? How can we take this time during Lent of testing and trial and sacrifice, which may last longer than Lent, this time of going without, and turn it into a positive? How can we not just survive these times, but to thrive during these times? How can we not merely get through, but to grow through these trials, to, to draw nearer to Jesus, to draw deeper in discipleship, to love God more than ever, and to develop spiritual muscle and stamina, even as we're maybe forced to kind of stand alone for a while, apart from the gatherings that we would normally enjoy on Sunday mornings. How can we take personal responsibility and grow through this time? Because like Jesus in the passage we're about to read, the devil will come and he will present himself he will try to tempt us and pull us away. He will try to discourage you and get you feeling down and even depressed. And yet, the good news today is that we can remain strong during this time of trial. So let's pray together before we, uh, before we look at the word of God. Let's pray. Father, again, we ask that you will add your blessing to the reading and now the proclamation of your word. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you, God, for the power in it. And we pray, O oh God, that you will simply guide us and lead us and teach us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's take a look at what Jesus did during his Lent, during his 40 days of trial and testing in the wilderness, even when confronted by the enemy. And I want to highlight for you today three simple tools for survival trial. And so we're going to break this text into three sections. And the first one is Matthew 4 verses 1 through 4. And this is the first temptation that Jesus faces. That is the first test. Let me read for you and please follow along. And Jesus was led by the Spirit into desert to be tempted by the devil. 
After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And we'll pause right here for a moment. Notice, first off, that it was the Spirit who led Jesus into the desert. The testing that Jesus was about to undergo was still somehow orchestrated and in the hands of God. Now, God isn't the tempter, but at times, much to our chagrin, he does allow the testing. Satan is the tempter, and he comes to Jesus here. And he says, if you are the son of God, he begins to attack the very character of, of Jesus, his own identity, just like he will for you and me. If you're really all that, if you are who you say you are, he says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, then he basically is saying, prove it, show it. Um, let's do a little miracle here, Jesus, is basically what Satan is getting at. Turn these stones into bread. How many of you know that the enemy is going to attack us right where we're most vulnerable. And I just want to say, these are real temptations that Jesus experienced. Uh, some people have kind of dismissed them and said that, well, this was just, you know, the divine side of Jesus. Jesus was just kind of going through the motions and the divine power of God in him, that these weren't even really temptations. I don't believe that. This is the, the very human side of Jesus. He had gone without food for 40 days and he was hungry. It was a real temptation. But Jesus responds, he replies to the enemy with these words. Very important. Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And here Jesus reveals the very first tool in combating the enemy and in surviving the trial and the testing. And this tool is simply this, the word of God, the word. You can write it in on your outline if you like, the word of God. In fact, in all three of these temptations, Jesus refutes Satan's challenges and false claims with the truth of Scripture. It is written, Jesus replies each and every time. And then in this first time, he comes right out and he says it. Man does not live by bread alone, but by the very words of God. That is the word of God. You know, Jesus, he knew his Bible, even his Old Testament, and he uses God's word in this time of trial to fend off the enemy's temptation. Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy, he said, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God or the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's power in the word, friends, and the question I want to ask you today, this app question, is whose word or words have power in your life? Maybe it's that of friends. It could be something that somebody wrote about you or posted about you on, on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram, and, and that those words, maybe they stung, maybe they hurt, and they have a kind of power over you. Maybe it's the words of your parents, and of course we should all obey our parents as young people. As we get older, we honor our parents. We should respect them. But occasionally, parents can even say some things, maybe when we're young, that were hurtful. And maybe we've carried those with us all the way into our adulthood. And we need to release those and to let them go and, and forgive our parents. Maybe it's the words of Fox News or CNN uh, or your favorite uh, news source that carries weight with you. Maybe it's the words of a celebrity, but Jesus is coming to us today and he's saying, may the words of God have power in your life. It is written. Know these words is what Jesus is implying and really teaching us today. Man does not live by bread alone, but by the very words of God. And those words are life. Those words can sustain us, especially in times of trial and difficult times. I can think of my own times in my life looking back where I have um, become overwhelmed with some anxiety. Maybe I was facing a crisis or a decision or going through a tough time and I realized that and in those moments I was being consumed more by my worry and self-talk and negative talk than I was 
being led by the words of God. Maybe you find that too when we get worried or afraid. The words of God can seem a little distant. It's been said that there are about 700 promises, some say more, in the Bible. But friends, you only need one to get you through each day or maybe each week. Just cling to one. Maybe it's uh, one of my favorites, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, where the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Maybe it's the words that the Lord says to Joshua, uh, the battle is mine, that be strong and courageous. Or maybe they're the words of Jesus himself in Matthew 28, verse 20, where he says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. We talked about this last week. You're not alone. Jesus is with you. Or maybe they're the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 28, where all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. May I challenge you during this time of trial to read the word of God, read it daily, lean into it, study it, meditate on it, memorize it, and live it. Don't be like James says, just to merely to listen to the word, but, but deceive and deceive yourselves, but no, do what it says. Friends, the word of God is a powerful tool May we lean on it, lean into it. Maybe you've got some extra time on your hands. It's a great time to begin reading maybe the book of Psalms or the Gospel of John just to get into the word every day because it will be a source of strength just as it was for Jesus in his wilderness during his Lent, during his time of going without. The second test comes to us also from Matthew chapter 4 and moving on now to verses 5 through 7. Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, there it is again, challenging his own identity. He says, throw yourself down, for it is written, he, that is God, will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up, they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. We'll pause right there a moment. The enemy comes to Jesus and he says, throw yourself off the temple, Jesus. He says, you have all the angels of God and almighty God at your disposal. Um, just do a miracle. Do something spectacular. You know, reveal your identity. It reminds me of the movie Bruce Almighty. Anybody ever see that movie some years ago where Bruce Almighty, the main character played by Jim Carrey, suddenly realizes he has all this power at his disposal and he begins to use it in kind of some inappropriate or very self-serving ways. Those of you who saw the movie, you know what I'm talking about. And it's the same thing that the enemy is telling of Jesus. Jesus, you've got all this power. You can just use it any way you want. In fact, he's really saying just use it recklessly. Use it, uh, use it in a way that would not necessarily honor God, that would serve, but would serve you. And Jesus replies, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, don't act recklessly and expect God to somehow rescue you. Don't make foolish choices and pray for God then to kind of come and bail you out. Don't play around with spiritual power, hoping for divine intervention as if you could force the, the hand of God. How many of you know we serve God? God does not serve us. He is not beholden to our whims and wants and wishes and every desire. The second tool that Jesus is implicitly pointing us to here is waiting, waiting. Jesus knew there'd be plenty of time for miracles later, although not the kind Satan wanted him to perform. But there would be a day when God would show up and do incredible things, and the day was coming very soon, in fact. The kingdom of God was breaking in through the person of Jesus. Today was not that day. Today was a day of testing and trial for Jesus. And it is as if Jesus is saying to you and me today too, pray, fast, and wait. Be patient, keep the faith, stand vigil, persevere in prayer, and persist through these present tough times. You may have heard the expression, patience 
is a virtue. Last week I shared with you that I believe that God's got this. And I firmly believe that God is up to something through this virus. Now let me be clear, I don't believe that God is the author of this virus. There's a lot of bad theology floating around. I've seen some of it on Facebook this past week, in fact. A lot of funny ideas that somehow this is God's punishment, that that God somehow is the author of sickness and disease and death. And friends, we know that that's not the case. We look at the New Testament, Jesus, who said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. Jesus died so that we would have life. Jesus' ministry was all about healing and granting life. He even resurrected his friend Lazarus from the dead. No, this disease and this deadly virus, it is simply a result of a broken, fallen world. Don't, don't attribute God with this. Uh, this is nothing uh, more than the work of the enemy. But having said that, it's important that we know that God can use this virus to bring about good. We, and it's important that we look at this through the lens of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We've already heard so many good stories coming out of this through the newscast. People helping people, people singing, and people bonding together even though they had to social distance from one another. Maybe this is a time when the goodness of humanity will shine. Maybe it's a time also when people will turn to Jesus like never before. Maybe it's a time when churches, even like ours, like Grace Church, will reach more people online through social media than ever thought possible. I looked at the stats this morning, and it turns out we had 269 views of last week's live stream on Facebook and another 17 views on the YouTube version that we posted. That's more than our average worship attendance by far. Maybe this is a season of renewal. And revival. Perhaps it is a season for pruning, but a time of blossoming and fruit and abundance is coming. We don't really know for sure exactly how God will use this, but we do know that God wants us to stand strong in the meantime, to pass the test, to be patient with him, and to wait. Don't worry, be holy. Purify yourself fast. Stand strong, be faithful, encourage one another, pray for each other. Keep the church strong with your prayers and your gifts. For this too will pass. We'll get through this. Waiting calmly in faith and hope and with patience and expectation. This is a powerful tool in times of trial. And Jesus is suggesting this even implicitly as he faces his testing. May we also wait. Things that I've done hasty or rashly out of frustration are usually the things that I regret doing. May we all lean on to, into the word of God and also wait. The second tool. Finally, the third tool. Tools for trial, uh, survival in trial. Uh, reading on now from Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will only bow down and worship me. We'll pause right there. Jesus, the enemy, says you can have all of these kingdoms. You can have all of this power right now. You can reign right now. You can have all political power if you would just choose to bend the knee and worship me. Jesus, you can have power, authority, significance and fame, you'd be second in command only to me. And this test, this trial, is really the test of shortcuts. Because first off, the enemy did not own, Satan doesn't own the kingdoms of the world, only God, he's the Lord. But it is also a test to short circuit the cross. It is a challenge by the enemy to avoid the suffering 
and the pain and the struggle that Jesus would, would need to go through in order to truly be the Savior of the world. And so Jesus replies, no, away from me, Satan. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus is saying, I will not compromise my mission or my ministry or my integrity or my identity by bowing down and worshiping you, Satan, let alone any worldly kingdom or power. Jesus is saying, I'm not focused on, on merely the purpose and plan of God. I'm focused also on the person of God, the only one who is worthy of worship. Friends, Jesus is again implicitly pointing us to the third tool of survival in times of trial, worship. How did Jesus make it through his personal Lent? I think he had a lot of time in the desert to worship. And we can make it through this season of trial and testing in the same way. What a great and powerful gift worship is to us from God. To get our mind off from ourselves, off from our own problems, off from our own losses and wants and needs and anxiety, and to focus on our great God always provides his greatness, his glory, his goodness. May we lift our hearts to him. You say, well, pastor, we're not in church. How can we worship? And, well, this is a good thing about worship. And sometimes we define our worship too narrowly as just Sunday morning gathering, but you know, we can worship God anywhere, anytime, any place. You can worship right there where you are. In your home, you can worship God on the job, you can worship God uh, at the kitchen table, at school, uh, or doing your homework in the house. You can worship God in the on the trails, out for a walk, or even lying down to sleep, or you can even sing in the shower. You don't need a hymnal or, or a praise band or an organ and piano to worship God. You can worship God anywhere, any place. And yes, you can use music if you want to. You can tune into your favorite Christian radio station. Um, you can play a favorite Christian CD or simply listen to music on your iPod or your phone uh, or to uh, the internet, YouTube, wherever it might be. Friends, there is nothing like worshiping, focusing your heart and mind on the goodness and glory of God to lift your spirit, to combat the doldrums, the loneliness, the fear, anxiety, the depression, and things of trying. And when we worship God, Satan is diminished. Look at verse 11. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended to Jesus. I have a feeling Jesus did a lot of worshiping during those 40 days. He may have been weak physically due to the lack of food. I believe he was stronger spiritually than ever before. This is what fasting prayer and worship can do for us. So during these times of trial, when we're prohibited from being together on Sunday mornings, may I challenge you, may I encourage you to worship God right there in your home. Read the Bible together. Let it speak to you. Meditate on it. Reflect on it. Discuss it. Have family devotions. Speak your praises and thanks to God out loud. Share your thanks around the kitchen table. Listen to some favorite worship music, if you like, and just simply tell God that you love him and why. You see, when our hearts and our minds are fixed on God and his goodness, you won't have time or space in your heart and your mind for worry and fear, anxiety and frustration, depression or feelings of self-pity. No, may we rise up and worship our great God, giving him all the praise and the glory. Just like Paul and Silas in prison, in less than perfect circumstances, and in isolation from others, yet they worshiped God. And what happened? The doors flung open. Their chains fell off. They were free. There's nothing like worship to free us from the chains that bind us. Friends and family of Grace Church, we're going to get through this. And I believe that we're going to come through this even stronger than before. I believe that by leaning on the word of God, by waiting in faith and patience and not acting out of frustration or hastily, and by worshiping God, these three tools will help 
get you, get us through this time of testing, no matter how long it lasts. And here's the really good news. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. The fact of the matter is, we're all human. And there will be times where we might become anxious, and we may fall short. The good news is, probably the best tool we have is Jesus himself. Jesus has given us himself, his own spirit, to come and take up residence within us, to live within us, to give us the strength and the energy and the power and the fortitude that we need to get through. Because even as we may from time to time fall captive to the enemy or fall victim to sin and temptation, there is one who stood the test. He was tried in every way, just as we are, and yet was without sin. Jesus passed the test. And so will you, so will we, for those who are standing in Christ and in whom the Spirit of Christ lives. May it be so. May God add his blessing to the sharing of his word today. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you that we could be together this way, together, on, uh, together online this morning. And Lord, um, we wish we could be together, but we're here. And we're here to receive your word. And Lord, we thank you for this message, this message, even the things and trials of just during kind of his own personal life. We're reminded today the power of the word and waiting in faith and worshiping you no matter what our circumstances are. So, or these are just a few of the many tools that you give to us. May we use them. May we lean to them. And may we be blessed by them. And so, Lord, we pray and we thank you that you are here. And that you never leave us nor do you forsake us. And so, God, would you come? And would you bless us, we pray, in your holy name. Amen. Normally, at this point in our service, we would receive an offering. Um, and uh, since we're not able to do that quite in the same way here online, may I just encourage you. Uh, I know that some of you are going through some financially tough times, or you may be. And you may not be able to, to kind of give at a level that you like to. But for those who can, I'd like to encourage you to remember the church with your gifts. And there's a few ways that you can give. Number one, you can just simply mail your gift into the church. Uh, you can uh, put it on your envelope, attend and receiving or recording the treasure. And uh, that will be placed in a secure receptacle. Uh, if you want to just pop your um, offerings off, you can do that too. You can drop them off at the church. and they will be, uh, you can put them in the church office. And we'll receive them there. If you want to use uh, bill pay uh, through your own financial institution, uh, we can get you a rowdy number. If you're interested in that, let me know, or Chuck Stasekall, our accountant. And then also, we're hoping to have an online, uh, through our website, uh, device or uh, option to give as well. And so check that out in the days that come ahead, that are lying ahead. We hope that we can have that coming, coming really soon. But it's important that we keep the church strong during this time. We certainly want to be ready to partner with God, uh, continue to partner with him even during this time uh, to see what God will do through this as well. Just a few announcements. Again, I'd like to welcome anybody who's visiting with us, uh, those of you who may not be a regular part of our Grace Church Fellowship. We're just so glad that you're able to join us this way online. We hope that we can maybe keep uh, some kind of an online presence going in the future, even when we do kind of get back to normal worship in our church sanctuary once again. So we welcome you. We welcome those who are guests and those who are maybe first-time friends of Grace Church. And uh, just invite you to stay connected with one another. Uh, the best way to do that is to get on to our church's email prayer group. And if you're not already on that, you can contact me and uh, or just uh, send an email to Cheryl Sires at Cheryl Sires at Yahoo.com. And that's where the bulk of our inside information will be shared, not here on Facebook, but through our 
prayer team over the course of the week. And, um, and so we invite you to be a part of that group if you're not already. And uh, feel free to also share this video and share the posts from our Grace Church uh, Facebook page with your friends and we to invite them to pass it along as well. As I made mention earlier, we'll also have a video of this on YouTube uh, in the days that lie ahead. And so stay tuned for that. I'll get that online as soon as I'm able to do so. And uh, just be assured, I am here for you as a pastor. I'm not going anywhere. In fact, I feel like I'm working harder now than ever just to figure out the technology and to make these adjust in our ministry together. But it's a good adaptation that uh, we need to make. And I'm happy and privileged to be your pastor during this time of struggle for all of us. The door open if you want to swing in and visit and say hi in social distance. If you uh, like to just come to the sanctuary and uh, kind of worship on your own or just sit the sanctuary to pray. The sanctuary doors are open and you're welcome uh, to do that as well. But know that I'm here for you and I'm praying for you and if you want to give me a call uh, throughout the week just to talk or visit, I'm happy to uh, to do that with you. Uh, since we're on Facebook and this will go out to the world, we're kind of refraining from mentioning personal names in our prayer time, but uh, we'll pray for those of, uh, those of you who um, need it and uh, those in kind of a general way and again a more specific list of prayer needs is put out through our prayer chain so please join the prayer chain if you're not already let's pray even now a kind of general prayer. let's pray together lord this is a time of struggle for many people and as we gather today even though we're separated we are still joined by your spirit and we lift up those who may be feeling lonely today. Or there may be some sick. There may be shut in. There are those who are hurting. There are those who are really worried about their finances right now. Lord, we would pray that you will just be with them and touch them by your grace and help each and every one of us to stay strong through this difficult time. Lord, uh, be with those who especially need to be checked in on, those who may be lonely those who may be shut-ins, those on our care shepherd listing, help us to be faithful in reaching out to them. Father, we, we pray also for our Each One Reach One campaign. Lord, uh, may we each be faithful, even during this time, and reach out to those who, who need to know Jesus Christ, who need his grace and his love and need to experience him personally. Father, we pray for our government leaders, President Trump and his administration. We pray for all of the authorities, Lord, and those who are working on this problem uh, around the world, uh, nationally, on the state and local levels. We pray for our governor and the governors across this great nation. Uh, we pray for mayors and people in authority and leadership all around, including fellow pastors and churches throughout the Cedar Valley as well and churches all around the world who are maybe scrambling to find ways to worship you in, in, in new and different ways. Uh, so Lord, be with each one and may you keep the church strong. May you bring revival and renewal to, to your people. May this be a time of turning to Jesus for many. Or be with those healthcare workers who are on the front lines. Keep them safe, provide them with their needs. Lord, we pray that you will be with those who are working in emergency situations, emergency workers, first responders. We think today even of our grocery store workers, Lord, those who are working to keep our groceries and gas station stores open. And uh, so, Lord, provide all with the supplies that they need. Lord, we pray that you'll put an end to this deadly virus. That you'll be with those who've already lost loved ones to it, those who may be sick right now, the families of loved ones and those who are struggling. Lord, be with each and every one and bring them your healing, we pray. Lord, again, for the church around the world, we lift them up. May this be a time of great witness. And so, Lord, together we close this prayer with the prayer that you taught your disciples. As we pray it together wherever we are, in our homes, or wherever we may be. Let us pray the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining me in prayer. I want to close today with this benediction. It's a word of challenge and encouragement from James chapter 4. May it encourage you today as well. Here's what James wrote. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. And humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Friends, may this be a time of humbling, a time of leaning on God like never before. I thank you so much for joining me today and for being together in this online community of Grace Reformed Church. Again, we're praying for you. We love you. Most importantly, God loves you. And I thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great time. And we'll see you next Sunday also at 10 a.m. for another live stream broadcast. God bless you. Thank you.